The future of our planet is closely linked to the way we treat our land. When it comes to mitigating climate change, conserving biological diversity and ensuring food security, healthy soils and healthy forests play a crucial role. Yet, agricultural soils continue to degrade. Forests and natural ecosystems often... Les écosystèmes sont souvent convertis pour élargir la production d'élevage et agricole. Nous savons ce qu'il faut faire pour inverser cette tendance. Des politiques cohérentes. Access to finance, knowledge and technology. Sustainable land use standards and regulations integrated and participatory land use planning, economic incentives, and social safeguards. In the end, it all depends on strong institutions and people acting together from local to global level to achieve the long-needed transformation towards sustainable land use across sectors, along supply chains, by scaling innovations, leaving no one behind. We have the solutions. Now let's talk action. Welcome everyone to this expert panel on land transformation. My name is Salina Abraha. I work with the Global Landscapes Forum and it's my honor to be moderating this session today because today we're gonna to be talking about how to move from competition for land use to integrative use. Moving from systems and structures which are contributing to degradation to solutions that enable sustainable transformation. We are a positive group of people. We believe that food security for 10 billion people is possible, that we can live within our planetary boundaries, but only when we transform global land use. So as the video just referenced, this session will take a close look at the role that institutions play in setting strategies and standards and other measures which can help drive this transformation. By looking at solutions from across the world, we're gonna create a space in this session and in the deep dive that follows to really dismantle knowledge barriers and overcome the sectoral and silo menta mentality that has contributed to the world that we're in today. But before we get started, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker to provide opening remarks. Um, we're so grateful to have you with us today. We have Parliamentary State Secretary of the Federal Ministry for Economic and Development, BMZ, Dr. Burbo Kufla. Thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity at least to meet virtually. I would, of course, have loved to see you all in person in Berlin and have a close discussion with all of you, but at least we can virtually meet, and I'm thankful for everybody who's organizing that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, well, as Alexander from Humboldt even 200 years ago said, everything is interaction. And with reference to the interconnection between nature and society, this is, I think, still a very important uh, quotation. Um, at least since then, if not before, scientists have been warning us that the competition for land use between different sectors and stakeholders is getting fiercer all the time. Today, the growing, the growing world population, the use of synth synthetic fertilizers and agricultural technologies, overgrassing and deforestations are all contributing to that factor. And today, almost everywhere on the planet, land is becoming an increasingly scarce commodity. Every year, 12 million hectares of productive land, and that is an area about the size of the state of Bulgaria, is lost. The humans are quite literally at risk of losing their very ground under our feet. Land use, therefore, needs to become sustainable from an economical, from an economic, environmental, and social point of view, so that everyone has enough to eat, our vital natural resources, climate and biodiversity is protected, and all people can live a life in dignity on a healthy planet. There has been international consensus on the necessary solutions for a long time. We've seen uh, the solutions described in the 2030 agenda, 
in the Rio Convention of the United Nations on Climate Change, Biological Diversity and Desertification, and many other international agreements. As SDG 15, the international community wants to work explicitly towards halting the global loss of fertile land and soil by 2030. But we are still lagging far behind when it comes to implementation. What do we need for sustainable land use now? An agricultural sector that protects natural resources, global structures that foster and promote sustainability and social justice, and responsible pattern of production and consumption. Well, first, we need to protect our vital natural resources. And that is true for my country, for Germany, and for uh, the whole world, and especially also for developing countries. That is why in our development cooperation work, we are supporting agroecological approaches in rural development and sustainable agriculture. Less use of fertilizers and pesticides, more regional cycles and markets that are rooted in local culture and tradition. This will benefit the people, the environment and the economy. The BMZ is working, for example, with communities in Africa and in, in India, to help them protect their land from erosion and preserve soil fertility. Local farms have had higher yields and for about 1.3 million people in these regions, the food situation has improved. The BMZ is engaged in fight uh, desertification as well. Germany is investing more than 600 million euros a year. But it is also a matter of rights. In order for smallholders to be able to invest, uh, they need rights to their land. That is a huge importance for women in developing countries in particular. This is because sources uh, secure land rights are necessary in order to create incentives for the sustainable use of resources and for investment in soil quality. And that is why German government supports the implementation of human rights instruments like the voluntary guidelines of the World Food Organization. Second, sustainable land use is a global issue. That is why global structures need to foster and promote sustainable land use, for example, in the case of trade. It is not enough in the globalized world economy just to make improvements on the supply side in the developing countries. The general conditions on the demand side also need to be adjusted. For instance, by making agricultural supply chains sustainable and deforestation free. And that is why the BMZ supports a strong European Union law to ban imports linked with deforestation and the regulation to supply chains. And finally, our production and consumption must also change. We need the private sector to get involved and take responsibility by investing in sustainable agriculture and infrastructure and through more education and training. And each and every one of us can make a contribution through our personal behavior as consumers that includes consciously choosing to buy fair products. And to, to conclude, the opportunity for major policy changes with regard to land use is there. You were saying we are an open, optimistic group today, and this chance uh, of making real differences is there. We have the knowledge, the experience, technical expertise, and also financial means. But there's also room for improvement, and we have to get started now so that the land and all its resources will continue to sustain and feed all humankind. Well, I said in the beginning, I'm very glad to uh, uh, thankful to everybody who is organizing the meeting today in this virtual room. Um, I'm looking forward very much to the contribution of our keynote speaker, Susan Neubert, um, and to hear more and learn more about governance strategies for the global transformation uh, to, of land to come. And of course, I'm here to listen also to our panelists. And I'm very uh, thankful that we have panelists from all parts of the world and to get to know their experience and their practical examples. Thank you very much for letting me open the session and back to you. Thank you so much for outlining that vision um, and for really telling us what is required for that transformation. So, you know, we've heard we need sustainable agriculture. We need global structures that foster justice, 
sustainable production and consumption patterns. Um, and we'll keep coming back to these points, these themes throughout the session. Um, but to really better understand how we move to implementation, what global land use transformation looks like, and why institutions are so important. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome our next speaker. She is an agronomist, an ecologist, and the co-author of the flagship report on land use, which was recently published by the German Advisory Council on Global Change. The report lays out the trilemma of land use and proposes five strategies of overcoming land use competition. To deliver our keynote titled Rethinking Land in the Anthropocene, I'd love to hand the floor to Susanna Newbert. Thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you see the slides? Okay, thank you very much. Rethinking land in the Anthropocene, from separation to integration. Five multiple benefit strategies should be pursued by five governance strategies. Oh. The trilemma of land use. The diverse demands made on land for the purposes of climate change mitigation, food security, and the conservation of biological diversity are already in competition with each other. The German Advisory Council on Global Change calls this uh, the trilemma of land use because at first glance, it appears that any one of these challenges can only be met at the expense of the other two. Finding solutions here will be decisive for, this, for sustainable land stewardship. The dilemma of land use can only be overcome. Climate change mitigation only succeed. The dramatic loss of biodiversity only be averted and the global food crisis only be resolved if we look at, for integrated solutions based on synergies and system approaches Together, this leads uh, to a fundamental change in the way we manage land. From separation to integration, we urge a systemic, sustainable approach to land stewardship as key. Ecosystems and ecosystem services deserve to be at the center of attention, whereby also promote effects on land use changes and land degradation must taken into, the, uh, into uh, account. In order to transform the global land use systems, we propose the following five multiple benefit strategies. First, restore terrestrial ecosystems. The bond challenge target of restoring 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030 should be significantly extended. The focus should be on forests, wetlands, and grasslands while simultaneously removing CO2 from the atmosphere as an additional benefit. Yet, this removal is no substitute for the necessary massive reduction in CO2 emissions. Second, protecting area systems. Effective interconnected protected area systems form the backbone of ecosystem protection. The expansion of and upgrading of protected areas are crucial. These areas should be extended to cover 30% of the Earth's surface. Third, promoting diversified agriculture. The EU agriculture policy should carry out a comprehensive ecological transformation from the CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, to the CAP, common ecosystem policy. An integrated landscape approach should be used for this integration. Multifunctional systems, such as rice fish systems, agroforestry, agrophotovoltaic, rice root intensification, and many others promote for uh, food security, climate change, mitigation and adaptation, as well as biodiversity conservation simultaneously. Fourth, the transformation of dietary habits. We suggest an orientation towards the planetary health diet, which should become a fixed principle of nutrition guidelines and should be recommended by the federal government. Fifth, shaping bioeconomy. Preference should be given to applications in which biomass 
and thus also the carbon it contains is stored for a long time. Building with timber is an example of effective ways for long-term carbon storage. In order to achieve this transformation, we propose five governance strategies. First, change agents. These are people and institutions that try out new forms of sustainable land use, practice them and propagate them as pioneers. Proactive states. The states can create framework conditions to prevent the further unsustainable land use. This can be price incentives, sustainability standards, or subsidies for sustainable land use. At the same time, society should reward the conservation and restoration of ecosystems. Third, the European Union. After the disappointing results of the reform of the CAP, the transformation of land use should be part of the European Green Deal. The CAP should be further developed into a CAP, common ecosystem policy, considering different uses, not only agriculture. Fourth, international cooperation. A global land summit should be convened. In addition, more attention should be given to the cooperation with the international research institutes, such as CGIR. For this, it is suggested to strengthen the co-creation of knowledge, through which scientists work more closely together with practitioners and vice versa. Fifth, new cooperation alliances. And by like-minded states, new forms of multilateral cooperation can be coming true. These can be regional alliances that implement an integrated landscape approach across borders or a global supranational alliance joining together for a global land use transformation. Thank you very much. This is the end. Thank you so much. It was so great for to really hear what those five pathways look like, um, so that the the audience has a you know an understanding of the breadth of actions that need to be taken from the local level, where we find pioneers who need support, to the proactive states you spoke about who can implement new standards, and also to rethink about you know how we are cooperating on an international basis. Um, and this is why I'm really excited to dive into looking at how these solutions play out in practice. Um, and to do that, we need to hear directly from the leaders who are promoting and implementing these governance solutions. So it's my honor now to shift into a panel discussion. We have representatives on this panel from Indonesia, Kenya, the European Union, and the UN Convention on Combating Desertification. So for the next half hour, we will hear about the governance solutions being taken across the world, um, what's working, what's not, and how they link to the five governance strategies just presented by Suzanne. So for everyone that's joining, we want to have this conversation with you to also learn from your experiences. So please make sure to use the chat to ask questions. We'll have a Q&A um, segment at the end and also to share your thoughts as we go throughout. So to start off this discussion, um, we wanna start really from the local level to understand the fundamentals of basic land use competition. What are the problems that we're facing? Um, and we're really lucky to have with us a representative from subnational government, Mr. Indra Kumara, Secretary of Environment Office of Kapua Sulu in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Thank you so much for joining us today. So you are working to avoid agricultural production in the high protection value forests you have. So I have two questions for you. First, can you tell us what are the main challenges of land use competition in your district and the strategy you're taking at the local level to protect those forests and to change agricultural practices? And then to link to Susanna's presentation, can you tell us who are the local pioneers and the champions in your district? How are they being supported? Are there instruments that you're, you're putting into place? So I hand the floor over to you. Thanks so much for being with us. Okay, thank you for this opportunity, Salina. Uh, actually, I feel nervous uh, speaking here. This is my first time international experience. And um, due to my lack of uh, my English, I hope all of you will understand what I'm trying to convey in this meeting. Actually, the island of Borneo consists of three parts of the country, namely Brunei Darussalam, the northern area, Sarawak, Malaysia, and the whole Kalimantan, Indonesia. 
Kapasulu district is located in the central part of Borneo, in the upper part of the province of West Kalimantan. The area of Kapasulu is about 31,000 km square, or roughly the size of Belgium. Due to the uniqueness of its ecosystem, Kapasulu district has been designated as a heart of Borneo in 2007 and as biosphere reserve in 2018. Uh, according to the, your question number one, based on our district land use plan, approximately the area of Kapasulu area consists of 30% of national park, 26% protected forest, 12% limited production forest, 6% production forest, 1% convertible production forest, and other land use area, 24%. Then, based on our experience, uh, there are four challenges in facing land use competition here. First, institutional system, which is able to breach the interest of a stakeholder. The second, policies and technical regulation, which support the implementation of sustainable land use management. Third, the availability of supporting data for sustainable land use management. And fourth, the determination of the uh, indicator value of the common of sustainable land management. Then, some of uh, our strategy carried out by the Kapuasulu District Government to realize sustainable land use management include developing multi-stakeholder institutions that are expected to communicate well the interest of stakeholders. Second, preparing and improving of regional regulation related to our sustainable land use. Third, improving the quality of development spatial data. And fourth, developing a sustainable natural resource management policy model using a dynamic system. And fifth, developing an information system of one development data and map as part of national policy of one data and one map of Indonesia. And according to the, your question number two, in our view, uh, the village government as the lowest government institution in the district is a pioneer in sustainable land use because they are the direct village uh, community development institution. Village communities are the direct beneficiaries of land use at the local level and the first negative impact recipient if there is damage to their land and their environment. Nationally, development funding at village level has been supported by uh, village fund allocation from the central and the district government. At the district level for the technical issue, uh, the village government will also supported by the community and village empowerment services, the public works and spatial planning office, the district development planning agency and also assisted by the department of the environment currently the instrument used in sustainable land use in the our district level are uh, district regulation on spatial uh, district spatial planning which is supported by a district spatial planning coordination forum however through the revision of our regulation there will be a uh, there will be additional article on the implementation of participatory village land use as the basis for the preparation of detailed district uh, spatial plan. Thank you, Salina. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, really quickly some of the challenges that you have and, and the solutions being put into place. Um, I heard, you know, developing multi-stakeholder institutions who can actually accurately represent the, the voices uh, of and different interests of those who are not being heard currently. Um, and also, really interestingly, um, on improving the quality of spatial data to inform decisions. And I hope we'll have a chance to also talk more broadly on the role of innovation and technology for driving these solutions um, when we get into the, the panel discussion. Um, but now that we've we've had a, a taste of what um, you know governance looks like at the local level, it, it's time to take a step back to the national. And I, I now want to invite our second speaker, engineer Laban Kiplagat, to better explore how integrated land use approaches are implemented at the country level and also across sectors. 
So engineer Kiplagat is the director and, and chief engineer for the agricultural land and environment management directorate in the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya. Um, and what I'm really interested to ask you about is the national agricultural soil management policy, which has been under development. You've gone under a process um, to develop and draft this. Can you share with us how this policy and process contributes to land use transformation in Kenya? And in addition, what are the key factors needed to make it work? What institutional instruments are you considering that are crucial to really incentivize farmers and other possible uh, pioneers? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Salina, and thank you, everybody. And uh, uh, to, to get into the point is that I want, first of all, us to understand that agriculture in Kenya is a mainstay of our economy. It contributes about 27% directly to the GDP and 25% indirectly to, through the linkages. Agriculture is one of the drivers of economy as per the blueprint of this country. However, the sector has been experiencing continued low productivity occasioned mainly by uh, declining soil fertility and deteriorating soil health. Soil management issues uh, are considered to form the basis of the success of the agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy, which is our main blueprint for agricultural transformation in this country. Of course, um, yes, lack of comprehensive policy and legislation on sustainable management of agricultural soil has been identified as a central issue in addressing the declining agricultural productivity. We know there are many actors with various mandates on natural resource management and scattered legislation, which at times conflict causing confusion and this forms the basis of this policy. Whereas there have been previous efforts, an interministerial task force was formed in 2015 to formulate the agricultural soil management policy with the support of GIZ. Uh, the formulation and relevant stakeholder process have been completed and the policy is awaiting cabinet approval. Uh, the soil policy issues require partnership and coordination with key partners, which include the county government, institutions dealing with natural resource, uh, uh, and resources, the academia, the donor group, civil society, and the private sector, among others. So to come direct to the point is that the agricultural soil management policy issue has now been brought to the center of all the ongoing national debates on food systems and economic development. Specifically, the policy has raised awareness on the services our soil provide to the society. It has also highlighted the various challenges facing soil and proposes various policy measures to address them. It has provided a framework for integrated approach to sustainable agricultural soil management. It has ensured regulated and coordinated investment in the agricultural soil in management, and it has provided enabling environment to support multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder collaboration in the soil management practice for sustainable land management. Of course, for it to work, there must be key factors that uh, must drive it, and among them, that, uh, that, that we have seen is that we have established a national agricultural soil management unit, both at the national and county level, to coordinate the implementation of soil activities. We have en enacted suitable legislative and legal framework to guide on the incentives and possible sanctions where necessary in the management and use of um, agricultural soils. We have strengthened research, extension, and farm band linkages, including capacity building. These are the factors that can make it work. Furthermore, uh, there is need for more financial resources towards sustainable soil management activities, both from within and from our donor community. And uh, we believe that also enhanced, enhancing ad adoption of best practices and scientific innovations, e.g. in gender, climate change, biodiversity conservation, soil testing, ETC across uh, agricultural value chain and food systems can also be a key factor. And finally, is that uh, we need the involvement of private sector to invest in sustainable soil management. These are the factors, but the institutions that uh, will really coordinate and regulate these include among the following. We have got the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, which is a national ministry, 
whose work will mainly be to uh, uh, policy implementation and review, mobilization of resources, and also coordination of other key agencies at national and international level. We have got the National Agricultural Soil Management Unit, which we will provide oversight and coordination of implementation of agricultural soil management programs in collaboration with county government and stakeholders. We have got the counties uh, government, which will oversee and coordinate the county soil management activities in collaboration with other stakeholders. We have got the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization, which will prioritize setting of demand-driven agenda uh, on, the, uh, on soil uh, research and development of research infrastructure in the counties. We've got universities and institutions of higher learning whose role will mainly be to identify key training priorities in agricultural soil management in collaboration with the national and county government. Equally, we have got Kenya Plant Health Inspection Services, whose main role will be to oversee regulatory functions on organic, biofertilizer, and any other soil additives. We've got the Ministry of Environment and Forest, which will be to oversee implementation of environmental policy. Uh, we have got the National Environment Management Authority, which will be to oversee environmental management and regulation. We have got the Kenya Bureau of Standards to oversee the quality uh, uh, standards in all the products that go to agriculture. And lastly, we have got the National uh, uh, Land Commission, whose role will mainly be to research on land use and, and uh, use of other natural resources, in, including formulation of review of land governance issues. So those are some of the issues that have, the policy has tried to put in place towards ensuring that there's sustainable land use uh, uh, in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's it's um I'm really glad that you've outlined you know the different institutions the roles that they play and really the breadth of uh, what this this policy process and in drafting it what this has created and hopefully the transformation we'll be able to see uh, for Kenya. But it's already great to hear that you know it's put soil at the heart of the conversations on agriculture and food systems and and land use. Um, so we'll be able to talk a bit more about that in in the Q and A. But um, I now want to turn to the regional level. So we heard in the beginning from Dr. Kofla on the importance of production and consumption patterns. She alluded to a, a, an EU uh, legislative uh, proposal. And we also heard from Dr. Newbert that the European uh, Union has a really unique role to play. So I feel it's only fitting that we now turn to our third speaker, Astrid Schomacher, who is the Director of Global Sustainable Development at the European Commission Green Deal. So I would love love to talk about this new demand side legislative proposal. Can you tell us what it's all about? Um, how does it support the EU's aims to have a positive impact on land use in uh, trade partner countries? And ultimately, how does it set incentives to help change the game? Uh, over to you. Thank you, Salina, and, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And yes, I want to speak about one specific aspect of our land use policy, and that's a new legislative proposal we made just about two months ago to fight uh, global deforestation and forest degradation. And we really hope that this proposal will be a turning point, not just in the EU's fight, but in the global fight against these phenomena, which are so closely linked to climate change and biodiversity losses, as the previous speakers have said. Now to jump right into this proposal and explain a bit what it does. Now, first of all, it's important to understand it builds on years of EU experience in fighting illegal logging, but then it goes beyond that. So we're moving our focus from just illegal deforestation to halting all deforestation driven by agricultural expansion for a range of commodities and products. Now, which are these uh, commodities and products? In the first place, we're focusing on six. It's beef, wood, palm oil, soya, coffee, and cocoa. And then also a number of products containing these commodities or produced with these commodities. And of course, we have selected these commodities after careful analysis to see how their expansion or the expansion of their production is linked to global deforestation. Now, we're trying to address the issue um, very much in line with one of the strategies also um, explained by the first speaker by setting sustainability standards. So we are defining what it means to be deforestation free or, uh, or not contributing to forest degradation. And we do that, of course, by using international 
internationally used definition, notably those by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Now, the way it works in practice is that we're putting responsibility on those that want to place these commodities on the EU market or export them from the EU. Important to know, by the way, this applies to both um, commodities produced in the EU, but also in third countries. This responsibility is uh, taken up via due diligence rules, so they're applicable to operators and large traders, and these have to guarantee that the relevant commodities and products they place on the EU market or export are both deforestation free and legal according to national laws in the country of production. Now, to do that, we have established in our proposal strict traceability obligations. That means that the commodities and products have to be traced back to the plot of land where they were produced via geo, uh, geolocation coordinates. That, of course, is necessary for enforcement and, and monitoring. And the operators and traders will not just have to do the due diligence, but they also have to attest to it via a due diligence statement in which they confirm that they've done the due diligence that will be hosted in a new database. Now, very importantly, we are also, also proposing to set up a benchmarking system to identify low-risk and high-risk countries. Products are sourced from low-risk countries can be put on our markets with simplified due diligence. Products sourced from high-risk countries uh, will face additional scrutiny from competent authorities. Also importantly, there's a cutoff rate. So we're only looking at products produced on deforested land after the 31st of December 2020. And I think many of you will immediately uh, recognize the date. That's the date uh, the SDGs have chosen and the countries have committed to hold deforestation globally. So deforestation after 31st December 2020. Now to, to also quickly still say a word on the second question, how do we think we can have a positive impact on land use in partner countries? Well, first of all, looking at these six commodities, the EU here is responsible for 19% of global imports. So what we decide has, a, has an impact. So if we address our footprint, if we limit our imports, that means we automatically lower the pressure on producing countries. And of course, we want to lead a global transition, not just uh, look at our own 20% uh, of imports of, uh, of these commodities. And again, there are two things I would like to mention here. First is the benchmarking system, I've already mentioned, will be a publicly available system. It will, of course, also be established. The country classification and low risk, high risk will be established in dialogue with the countries, but it will be publicly and, uh, available, which means that we hope that also other countries will look at it and that it will really create incentives for producing countries to go into this low risk category and therefore, of course, benefit from increased market access and easy market access in the EU. And secondly, there's something we call the Brussels effect, and that's not about wanting to boast that we regulate the world, not at all. But we have uh, uh, noticed uh, in the past that companies choose to abide by the most stringent international standard, rather than you know producing to different standards around the world. And so we hope that uh, the many global companies that are involved in agricultural supply chain will choose to abide for all their um, imports around the world by um, our deforestation uh, free requirements. And I just want to say in my probably last minute, um, one word, this is a demand side regulation. And I think we've already heard in the beginning, it is important that we address the demand side. I just want to be always very clear, addressing the demand side is one part of the equation. It is, of course, equally important that we work with the partner countries. Uh, the State Secretary has already mentioned that Germany, for example, but also the EU, we're very engaged with partner countries in cooperating with them to strengthen sustainability of supply chains, to strengthen forest management, to strengthen civil society. And the examples we've heard from Kenya and Indonesia are obviously very inspiring and in the kind of uh, policies that uh, we would want to support. And it's also important, as we did my last sentence, that we um, cooperate, of course, also with other consumer countries, but that we also look at financial markets and see how we can steer investments towards those companies that care about their supply chains, and also that we work uh, again with producer countries, but also with the global scientific community to improve data availability and fully explore the digitalization and big data, so our uh, satellite observation systems. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I am um, really appreciated that on, on, you know, being able to hear just what the EU, uh, what the EU ambitions are and how you're really stepping up uh, to provide leadership globally and in the, you know, the ripple effect, the Brussels effect that we'll see um, happen across the world. So uh, we're looking forward to, to discussing this more and also talking about, you know, these critical other elements that I think are uh, underpinning a lot of the discussions that have come up so far on finance and technology. Um, I hope that we can, uh, you know, further discuss some of these commonalities that we we all face and share in, in the Q&A. Um, but before we do that, we get to go to our, our last panel speaker um, who gets to really talk about this international cooperation element. We heard in the keynote uh, about a land convention, about really changing the way that um, we're engaging countries and creating a global conversation um, on land use. So I'd like to now invite Louise Baker, who's the Managing Director of the UNCCD Global Mechanism, to talk about the Land Degradation Neutrality Framework, um, which really is a a great opportunity for us to look at a cross-sectoral approach to conserve land. Um, can you tell us how does the land degradation neutrality framework build on and support local, national, and regional efforts that we've just heard to contribute to land use transformation um, and what is needed to make it work? Thanks, Selena. This is great. I was I was kind of really pleased to be going at the end. I'm like, everybody will have said everything. There'll be nothing for me to say. In fact, listening to everybody, I've got loads to say now. <laughs> Very good. Perfect. Um, yeah, land degradation neutrality, it's the kind of the framework that the, um, the SDG set up. So it's SDG 15.3. It's also sort of the organizing principle for UNCCD. Mostly it means doing the right thing in the right place at the right time and the right scale. So it's about managing those trade-offs within the landscape. Um, to reduce degradation, certainly, to protect, to sustainably manage, and to restore the land. So far, actually, 128 of the 195 parties to UNCCD have set their targets and have identified 450 million hectares of land that they want to restore. So very much kind of, it, this is in addition, actually, to the, to the bond challenge land. So globally, we add up to a ra just short in terms of the commitments under UNCCD, under Bond Challenge, under the NDCs and under CBD, uh, we add up to just short of a billion hectares of land that's been identified as having the potential to be either conserved or to be better managed or to be restored. So I think there's what we're seeing actually is a real change in terms of the way that we used to look at the land as meh, so now being really a recognition that there's a billion hectares out there that if properly managed could make an enormous contribution to greater food security, to climate mitigation, to greater biodiversity. You see this actually in terms of things like the G20 under both the um, Saudi and then Italian presidency committing to restore terrestrial ecosystems. You see it in the work that we're doing with things like uh, where we're backstopping the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall on the, this massive regional initiative across Africa to, to restore 100 million hectares uh, and across the land from Dakar to Djibouti. So there's a sort of regional movement there that we're seeing at national level and in the private sector. Um, at UNCCD, we've had an interesting uh, experience working with the private sector and impact investors who have really seen um, established sort of land and the process of restoring degraded land as an asset class, as something that if you improve the productivity of the land, you, you, um, you're, making a, you're making a profit, you're making economic sense. And um, so this is really a, a sort of an innovative, innovative vehicle. You asked us, how do we scale up? How do we kind of, um, how do we help? How does this help? contribute to all of the other um, and the other initiatives that are going on. And I think there's a few areas. I would say land use planning, uh, where it's the combination of urban and rural at the landscape level, spatially very specific about what we want to try and do. I think our targets so far have been nice, but they've not been specific enough. So I think we want to pin those down. Cross-sectoral cooperation with multi-stakeholders, 
far too often the work on land ends up either in the agricultural um, ministry or in the environment ministry. But I think kind of like climate change, this is a sort of all of government response now. This is an economic issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a jobs issue. It's a, uh, yeah, the economy issue. Um, we need the signals from the governments. And I, I very much appreciate the work that the European Union is doing on, on this deforestation revalue chains. Send the right market signals and we will change production patterns, which I think is very exciting. Um, governance and tenure, um, you know, actually people invest in the health and productivity of their resources if they feel that they will continue to have control over those into the future. If you can take away their land, yeah, there's less incentive to invest for the long term. And for us, which has been a challenge, and an unexpected challenge, actually, is as the kind of international uh, framework for land restoration and investing in land has improved, actually, we've noticed that there is not the pipeline of bankable projects to invest in neither for governments or multilateral institutions like the EU, like the, the VMZ who want to invest in land, neither for national governments, neither, neither for the private sector. So actually it's something we're working on with support from VMZ on scaling up um, the work on developing a pipeline of bankable projects at the right scale with the right stakeholders engaged. And I think, moving from talking about targets to bankable projects that we can deliver on the field is really, uh, really critical. We don't have a land summit, but we do have a COP coming up, a conference of the parties coming up in Abidjan in May. And hopefully many of these discussions will take place there as we launch the, the partnership for project preparation. I'll stop there, Selena. I'm looking forward to the conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, just bringing us full circle. I think it was really important um, to really go from the subnational, national, and then and then see what, what's happening at the international level, how UNCCD is um, really promoting and, and building on what exists, um, but also pushing countries to, to go that extra step further by bridging it to, um, you know, the finance mechanisms and the, the innovative kind of solutions and discussions that are popping up. Um, so I think, you know, now we've We've had an opportunity to, to just get a taste of each case. You know, we haven't gone really in depth and heard the nuances. Um, but what I'd love to do now is to begin to kind of extract and identify some key lessons and themes um, that we can use to think about uh, how we can scale up some of these solutions and, and also learn from some um, challenges that we've, we've faced in the past. Um, so for those that are watching, if you do have any questions, now's the time to throw them in the chat. We have um, just about 10 minutes left probably to, to have this. but um, what I'd love to do is maybe come to uh, engineer Kiplagat. So this question will come to you. Um, I wanna know what do you think still hinders land users from adopting sustainable practices, right? We put in these institutional efforts, you have this wide uh, you know, group of, of stakeholders and actors in place to do the capacity building, the training, the, um, you know, the county government's engaged. What do you think is, is still hindering land users and where might you think uh, you know, we may fall short? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think a lot has been being said, but uh, still we find that um, the adoption of sustainable practice is still a bit uh, weak. And to me, I think the one of the most critical issue is knowledge. It is true that people don't know that, uh, that, um, that as you use your natural resource, which is a soil for agriculture, you are really um, um, re uh, exhausting it at a faster rate and also losing it at a faster rate. So I think to me, the most important thing is knowledge. We need to bring uh, that awareness to all the potential users of the soil so that we see how best they can uh, uh, work from an, an informed point of view. The second thing that I think is also there is um, um, resources. Sometimes to undertake um, uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, activity that, 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 that uh, protects the soil will require funds. Like, for example, part of Kenya is still arid, and uh, 
because of climate change. It's usually when it rains, sometimes there's too much rain and because of land degradation, uh, they, they, they are gullies. They are gullies as a result of floods. So restoring that requires uh, money. And I think finally is uh, uh, there should be an inducement uh, to, to, to towards um, those who have uh, those who have uh, those who have uh, those who have have done something good. For example, how does a government, both national and county, uh, incentivize those that uh, try to uh, do something, be it individual farmer or group of farmers? So I think that's uh, what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's really important um, because we, we you uh, talked a bit about the capacity building that's necessary. Um, because at the end of the day, we're talking about you know moving really shifting and having a transformation that requires first step one, having the knowledge, the policies and incentives in place. And then the crucial element that I think Luis was also talking about is where is this, this pipeline of, of bankable projects, the pioneers, are they actually being supported to take that knowledge into practice um, and have the resources that they need to change their practices. Um, so I, I wanna turn to um, Mr. Kumara to, to better just hear your perspective on this for Indonesia and your state. Um, do you feel, what do you feel like is missing in terms of ensuring that land users are adopting the sustainable practices? Um, and given you know the strong link to uh, what Ms. Schomacher had presented around the EU um, and this new policy that may be put in place, do you think that this offers an opportunity um, for these land users to shift practices? Um, what do you think that it's, how is this going to impact your district? Yeah, actually, uh, we are in Kapuasulu district trying to uh, implement the sustainable land use uh, at the village level, and we need more support from uh, other stakeholders. And yeah, we don't know yet how uh, impact the AU regulation uh, to our district because uh, we don't know yet about the, the progress of this regulation but we try to uh, to conduct based on our experience that the village level they need like uh, sustainable land use uh, we try to develop a sustainable natural resource management policy model using a dynamic system at village level because uh, we try to combine the social, ecology, and uh, economic uh, aspect. And we hope uh, using this uh, dynamic system, we can balance uh, the uh, social aspect, economic aspect, and ecological aspect. Uh, this is uh, in Kaposulu. And Actually, we try uh, after using a dynamic system. Uh, we hope the result will be using a spatial dynamic model in uh, our district. This is uh, Salim. Thank you. You know, I, I I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it, it re-emphasizes the importance of these policies and really providing the enabling environment that's necessary um, for local pioneers to be able to take action for us also to bridge what's happening at a global level with the local level, um, really having solid um, subnational and national policies al allow that transformation to be to be a bit easier. Um, so, you know, we've had an opportunity a bit to talk about international cooperation. Louise, I, I want to come back to you. Um, now that you've, you've heard kind of um, some of the reflections in response to your remarks, do you feel that, you know, the forms of cooperation we have in, in, in your view, well, do you think that this will achieve land transformation? What more should be doing? Should we be doing? Is, is this enough? Or do you feel like there's, there's more that we need to be discussing and talking about? Um, I, I think the, thanks, thanks, Selena, good points. I think that the international framework is better than it's ever been, that there is a sort of movement here that we've got to capitalise on and deliver on. So I think at kind of international level, the understanding that the link between climate, food, biodiversity, sort of underpinned by healthy land, is sort of there now. But the, the translation of that into to real policy that actually impacts people on the ground, I think, isn't there. 
The incentives, taxes, subsidies discussion is a national level discussion. I think what we're looking for now is that those translate into um, the subsidies, incentives for um, smaller land use holders and land users. So whether that's tenure regimes, whether it's knowledge and capacity building, whether it's access to markets, whether it's access to finance, access to better technology, um, actually also it's almost a kind of intergenerational type of commitment as well, that actually the, the land is being abandoned because it isn't making a livelihood that has got perspective for young people. So I think there's also about engaging kind of the future generation of land users, inspiring them and providing a kind of a framework around which they can sustainably manage the land, make a livelihood and, and build for the future. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say people at the centre of this as well, consumers and producers and most importantly, the, the land users who are we rely on them to get it right and we rely on them for the future of our food security and for the future stewardship of our world, really. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I, I'm seeing so many questions now pop in the chat and I just want to share, you know, you'll have an opportunity um, in just a few minutes when we wrap up, we'll be doing deep dives so you can ask your questions directly to the speakers. Um, so I just want everyone to know that I've not left you out, but um, I want to pick up one question from the chat. There's one from Annette um, and she wants to dive into this question on the private sector. So I want to ask you, uh, Ms. Schumacher, um, she's basically asking, how are the big players of the private sector, you know, the Nestle's, Cargill's, um, how are they gonna get involved to take their responsibility for land use since they cause such a big demand for agricultural commodities? Um, and given your experience with, uh, you know, illegal logging, could you maybe just share how you think um, this policy will be able to really influence these, these players? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think the focus on illegal logging actually was not so successful because we've seen deforestation continue. So that's why we're now shifting um, to, to looking at also deforestation that is legal but driven by agricultural expansion. And of course, as I was mentioning before, it's very often largely big uh, companies that are behind the, the purchasing decisions. And there's a lot that's going on uh, in voluntary terms. Uh, lots of commitments that companies have made, the global consumer goods from individual commitments by companies for deforestation free supply chains. But if we look at the reality of deforestation going on, these are very valuable, but they haven't had the impact and the scale that we actually need. And that's why we have come to the conclusion that we need to have rules by which everybody has to abide that wants to place uh, commodities linked to deforestation on our market. And I think simply by mandating, as simple as it sounds, that whoever places a commodity on our market needs to know exactly where that commodity comes from and needs to demonstrate to due diligence that care was taken throughout the supply chain and, and that the legal, um, the legal requirements of the producing country um, were respected, we will be able to turn the behavior of these companies around and they are engaging with us. And we see a lot of best practice and I also want to say that maybe as a last sentence, a lot of what we demand looks as very ambitious. So when we say you trace your commodity back to the plot of land, that sounds complicated and ambitious. It is ambitious, it is complicated, but we also know it's doable because we have been working with companies and we know it's being done. So it's the best practice that is there and what's needed now is to scale this up, to broaden it. And of course, also again, come in with cooperation, come in with financial support to enable everybody, including also the smallholders in, in developing countries to, to live up to those requirements um, that we put uh, forward and the companies will have to abide by. Thank you so much. I love that. It is ambitious, but it is doable. I feel like that's a great way to sum up uh, this session. Um, you know, we've seen and we've heard from UNCCD that the international cooperation is really the best it's ever been. Um, but we need to take the steps to really have institutions implementing the standards, the policies, um, shifting the uh, environments in order to get us to that transformation. Um, but I hope that this has been some, you know, an opportunity for you to get a taste of some of the proactive states and legislations that, that are being implemented, the policies we're discussing on the ground. Um, and for all of you that have questions, there are many. You have an opportunity now to talk to the speakers. We will have two virtual rooms, one featuring Mr. Kumara from Indonesia and Ms. Shomaker from the European Commission. And the second room will have Ms. Baker from the UNCCD 
and engineer Kip Lagat from Kenya. So you're welcome to bounce between the different rooms and carry on this conversation. It's really important uh, that we have this all together. So thank you so much for being with us for this hour. I've really enjoyed this conversation um, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.